Hey guys, welcome to the first session of our course tonight. Um, I will be doing 30 minute uh, recordings to break everything up so that you don't have to sit through, you know, whatever it is, a six hour lecture, however long I go. Um, so I will be chopping it up, chopping it up into uh, various sections of what I believe is the right amount uh, of information for a specific section, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Um, so let's get right into it. I'm going to share my screen. Now, this is a PDF that I received from you know, my own uh, course and insights uh, into numerology. Uh, so you will also receive this PDF. Um, I'm kind of going by it. Majority of the information will be going by this, but I also obviously provide uh, my own insights and what I've discovered from my own experience through readings and things like that. Oops, you don't need to see me twice. Okay, so um, let's get into what numerology really is, um, the various types of numerology and how we can really apply it. So numerology is a reflection of astrology really right so it's a different perspective that you can use to kind of decode your life um, it is really a, a decoding of your life because it is my belief that this whole universe this whole simulation is a simulation and it is therefore scripted that's why we can kind of um, really discover certain elements to our, our lives to our personalities to you know, future events that can be plotted uh, based on the energies reflected in numerology and in astrology. Now, when I say numerology is a reflection of astrology, what do I mean? I mean that the numbers themselves are based on the specific planets, right? And we'll get into each number and their meaning and all that later on. Um, the difference between numerology and astrology is that astrology can get much more specific in uh shorter time spans whereas i feel numerology is much better at predicting longer time spans okay so for example nu numerology for two twins is going to look exactly the same obviously because we only go by their birthdays right so they will reflect the same energies that they are embodying um on the other hand when we take into account things like their time of birth like they do in astrology um this will become obviously much more specific and you will start to notice the differences between the twins, even though a lot of twins are very similar to each other. I mean, that's why they're, they're twins, right? Um, now, in terms of when numerology and astrology actually work, it is more a reflective uh, tool for someone that is not fully aware of themselves okay so it is basically working around the ego because that's what the personality is personality is a reflection of the ego how it's been shaped by exterior circumstances but also the qualities the strengths and weaknesses that has been have been given to that uh, mind element right um, um, pre-birth okay now the way that i believe the soul is structured is the soul is a sort of ball of energy right it's in a, a capsule where it, it holds let's say a divine spark but it also holds the ego an artificial self um and we automatically are implanted with this ego with this parasite uh, upon birth where it kind of seeks to really engulf the, that divine spark. Now, through my research and what I've been really trying to dig deep into is, can that divine spark be modeled in numerology and astrology? And from what I've seen yet, no, not necessarily, right? So that being said, then what is the point of numerology and astrology, right? I think this numerology and astrology is really useful 
for helping someone get out of their ego or someone that is really into the spirituality and seeking to better themselves but also to better understand other people and how to help them how to help them deal with the energies that will come towards them that will um they will be kind of uh engulfed in based on the movement of the plants and the the script that was created for them and potentially by them um and they will understand that these energies are not necessarily them right they're not that divine being that is trying to actually come out as the higher self is integrated right so when we understand that hey oh my ego is much more likely to act this way in these certain situations um then the person starts becoming aware of them more aware of themselves of their personality of these things that they've naturally uh attributed to their identity right which is uh identity is a, a false belief system in my opinion because it's the false self it's the ego it's the artificial implant um, so that's how we really can study uh, ourselves and each other. And, you know, uh, the right people will be drawn to this sort of information. So if you don't understand all of that, I just said, don't worry about it. Take the rest of this information uh, as it is, because it does work. And, uh, you know, go from there. You will progress in your understanding uh, with time and what you're ready to hear, okay? So now this, first of all, what, what we're practicing here is a Vedic interpretation of numerology. It is, in my opinion, the oldest um, and happened right before or right after the split in astrology and numerology because Vedic numerology and Vedic astrology seem to be the most accurate uh, tools that we have and even they are still lacking a little bit because they are complementary to each other. But there are also small inaccuracies between um, between uh, the actual constellations and where they are. But with numerology, they're not based on the constellations necessarily or the location of the constellations. They're based uh, more on the numbers and their expressions in terms of the planets. Okay. Now you can use them in combination to see if they line up with each other and most of the time i found that they do and they're reflective of the energies happening at the same time for that specific person okay now i said these, these we're using vedic because there are other types of numerology that exist vedic by the way is the eastern version the hindu uh the for comes vedic comes from the vedas vedas is basically I believe it means knowledge or passed on knowledge. Um, that was passed by word of mouth. But um, it was something that they were kind of given, I want to say. They, they didn't necessarily discover by themselves. And this knowledge was maintained and passed on uh, through ancestry, right, through families. So other forms of numerology include Kabbalah numerology. This is um, based in... 10 you'll see vedic numerology is based in numbers one through nine cabal numerology it says it has 22 vibrations right here but really it's based in the number 10 they considered 10 is their perfect number and if you study their tree of life or if we can call it the tree of life is not i think it's an inorganic tree of life in my opinion you can see here this might be the actual organic tree of life that's base 12 but their tree of life has has uh, 10 sephiro with the hidden 11 which would be this one number eight here that's their hidden 11 they don't they don't show that that's just kind of reserved uh and that's called Daath. um so uh 10 they consider 10 the perfect number kabbalah numerology based in hebrew the hebrew alphabet um really it's a derivation of latin or latin is a derivation of this uh and i've recently learned and heard i don't know if it's absolutely true that uh, the hebrewic uh 
the Hebrew language is an inversion really of Arabic, okay? Because uh, the Arabic and Aramaic language uh, and numerology potentially even existed prior to the to the Hebrews. Yeah, and then we get into something like Chaldean numerology, which you'll see later on the course that we also use uh, very closely. Um, it is the most ancient cipher, and we will be using it in turn for uh, um, word decoding, okay? As the Vedics don't have their own uh, numerology for for actual words, right? We're simply using numbers, but the Chaldeans were, I think, operating at the same time as the Vedics, and they're very closely related. So they, but they have their own interpretation of the actual numerology, which I've also studied and can say there is a certain um, accuracy to their knowledge, um, very good accuracy. But I still still believe um, Vedic is just a step further uh, in their understanding. Um, they place a lot of emphasis on the base number, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, they operate numbers one through eight, uh, so eight numbers, and they regard the number nine as something sacred, which doesn't necessarily line up with the Vedic interpretation, which we'll also discuss later on. Um, and of course, we have our modern day, oh, this is the Arabic one that I was talking about. Whoops. Didn't mean to do that. See the Arabic system numerology, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. That reminds you of the common telephone, cell phone pad, right? And this is actually very Saturnian based. I uh, haven't really studied that very much though. The Pythagorean one is the modern numerology that we have um, that you see all over the internet. Uh, this is not that, I've studied that as well. I did not find very much accuracy with it as well. It's, in my opinion, tied to the tropical system of astrology, which is 50% accurate, um, in my opinion, because the constellations that they use in this Pythagorean version um, are from 4,500 years ago, right? So the, the Earth's shift, uh, the Earth pole or alignment has shifted and it's not aligned with where those constellations were uh, 4,500 years ago, right? So with the precession of the equinox, we've moved uh, 23.5 degrees backwards since, right? So when they say the sun is in Aries from a tropical perspective, if you really look up in the sky, the sun is potentially in Pisces, right? And that's just uh, a Vedic interpretation well, not even, not even just the Vedic interpretation, but simply looking up at the sky, you'll see that, hey, you can't really say the sun is in Aries when we clearly see that the sun is transiting Pisces at the time, right? So that's where the accuracy falls off, in my opinion. Then we have Chinese numerology. The, this is based on perfect square. There's potentially some accuracy to this as well. The perfect square is based, uh, each planet has a perfect square, if you study a lot of the occultists, they created a lot of a perfect square for each planet. And I've, I've gone into that a little bit as well. And that's mainly used, I would say, for, for sigils, for rituals, um, for magic, potentially black magic. So I don't necessarily recommend getting into that without you knowing what you're doing because black magic can definitely create um, some uh, contracts and that, that you may not necessarily want to have, right? It's always a give and take with, uh, with, the, with these entities or with these black black magic. You know, you, you take something, but you have to give okay? or they expect you to give something later on, right? It's That's the contract that they're implying. So just be careful with things like that. Um, um, Pythagorean neurology, we'll discuss that a little bit. You know, the low shoe grid. Okay, so let's talk about uh, a little bit about how our Vedic grid is structured. So when I go to you know do someone's chart, this is how we'll draw it out. Simple tic tac toe right here chart. 
Okay, and this is uh, right here. I'll show you the specific placements of the numbers. Okay, so now you won't obviously always see the chart looking like this because not everyone is going to have these numbers in your birthday and their birthday. What do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. So example. Um, let's say June 27, 1997. Okay. So we would make a chart for this birthday. And just by putting all the numbers we see here, we would put six, two, right? A seven, another seven, and a nine. Now you're wondering why didn't I put these numbers? Well, this right here is the century number. Everyone born in the 1900s it's going to have a one and a nine. So we ignore those. They're still important uh, and they define, you know, a population, a generation, not even a generation, a very large denomination of people as a whole, that they're more than likely to be, uh, you know, with the one and nine qualities, which we'll discuss. Um, but we don't necessarily put it in the chart, right? So we have a nine, this nine here is from this nine right here. And this other seven is from this seven, right? Now, what I didn't speak about yet is the base number. Oops, that big of an arrow, the base number. The base number is this whole thing and the life path number, which is all the numbers added together. Now the base number it's a very important number, and this is what I talked about in regards to the Chaldeans um, placing very large significance on it. So the base number, in order to get a single digit, we would have to add up the two numbers and get a single digit, right? So the base number really is nine, right? So if our base number was 23, if someone was born on the 23rd day, it would be two plus three equals five, okay? So I just wanna make it excessively clear. But since the base number is not 23, it's 27, we have to add the two plus seven and we get a nine. Now, if the base number was just nine, right? If someone was born on the ninth, then we just leave it as nine, okay? And you see, we already put the two and the seven, right? So we put two and the seven just simply because they're in the, in the birthday, two and, two and seven. But if it was just nine, we would will, will only put one nine. We don't need to put it twice, right? This, we're only putting a two and a seven simply because it's another representation of nine. And that needs to, the two and the seven need to be taken into account as well as their summation, which is nine, okay? Now the life path number, many, new, many of you, if you're interested in numerology should already know how to calculate the life path number because you probably looked it up online, it's very easy to find, and it's a, it's a common theme online. So the life path number would go something like this, six plus two plus seven plus one. This time we do take into account the century number, plus nine, plus nine again, plus seven, right? We take it into account because now we have to sum all the numbers and they are playing a significant role in the total sum. So six plus two plus seven um, plus one plus seven, we know two plus seven is nine. We have nine, nine here. So the nines, when you add nine to something, it just becomes, it's the same number. So one plus seven is eight plus six is 14. Right, eight plus six, eight plus seven plus six, 13 plus one, 14, right? And then to get our final number, we always want to reduce to one digit, we get five. So we have to add that to the chart. And that would be the chart that you would conduct a reading for, okay? Um, that's what you would analyze. And these are the numbers you would take into account. 
Now, when we get into later in the course, you'll see that other numbers will be added based on uh, the year they're in and um, the major and minor energy for that specific time period. But for now, these are the foundational principles of the chart, right? That's, that's it. That's all we got to add. That's all we have to look at right now. Now, in normal modern Pythagorean numerology, they take into account numbers like 11, oops, 22, 20 uh, and 33. Um, these, they call these the master numbers, okay? Um, and they do not reduce these. In Vedic numerology, these are never taken into account and they're always reduced. For example, um, if we have the birthday, one, three, 19, 96. you'll get the calculated life path for that. One plus three plus one plus nine plus nine plus six, okay? So we get one plus three, four plus one, five plus six is 11. Plus nine plus nine Technically, you would have to add these to see the full result. It would be um, 29, right? You simplify it again, you still get 11 because 2 plus 9, boom, right? 2 plus 9, you get 11. And now what Pythagorean numer uh, numerologists would say, nope, that's it. That's where you stop. He's a life path 11. But you can't represent life path 11 in the chart. You, you don't just add two ones and say that's life path 11 right there. No, because life path 11 is really a life path two. Now, this is where I try to get into a little bit more of the divine spark, let's say, of, hey, is this soul more evolved? Is it more mature? Is it more, has it have more of its ego integrated? That could potentially be reflected in this work, but from a beta perspective, they're just a life path number two. Now let's let's consider the Pythagorean perspective. Okay, um, they have a thing called potentials. Um, so there are pure master numbers, and there are master numbers with potential, potential of embodying a higher version of the number two, for example, which is eleven. Now, number 22 is a higher version of the number four, and number 33 is a higher version of the number six, okay? And I, I do believe that to be true. I've seen that reflected, and that is a part of um, a part of the Pythagorean, Pythagorean numerology that I do believe to be true and effective. So uh, in that case, let's discuss um, the slide slight difference in calculating. So one plus three again, plus one plus nine, plus nine plus six. Again, this is the century number. So it doesn't have as much of a regard as we would usually have. So we always add the nines last, just like I did here. Uh, in Pythagorean. So we'll do 1 plus 3 plus 6 plus 1 plus 9 plus 9. And then we'll see what we get. Um, so again, we get 11 plus 9 plus 9 equals. Now, we have two 9s here. One of them is a century number, so it has less significance in my opinion. I'm not sure exactly how the Pythagorean numerologist would consider this. Um, if they would write it as 11 with two Ps or 11 with one P. This P is in regards to the number of nines it has and the potential. If someone was a pure master number, 
they would just write the master number, which in this case is 11. That is pure. That means they don't have to really work for anything. They, were, they will naturally express the qualities of the 11. Whereas someone with multiple Ps will has a smaller potential of expressing uh, those 11 like qualities as opposed to the pure. This 11 with one P is also very strong and can definitely exude it later on in their life. Um, but these, uh, this two P's is maybe not even as likely in this lifetime, but the potential is there, right? So based on the number of nines, I would say, uh, would you would write the number of P's. Now, again, this is the century number, like I said, so uh, the nine is part of the century number, which is 19. So it's very likely that that may not be as significant. So in my opinion, I would write 11 P, right? Um, they have the potential. So I would write uh, this one right here, this middle one as an accurate representation of their birthday. A life path 11 with the potential of being a true life path 11 and exuding those qualities um, later on in life. Okay. But at the end of the day, they are still a life path too. Right? All master numbers still have the lower self version in them. Right? The 22 st still is a four. 33 still is a six, so they will always reflect the qualities of the four and the six. No matter if they figure out their their life path is 22 and they say, oh my God, I'm a master builder, look at me, you know? Uh, well, hold on a second, because more than likely you may have some work to do to really get there, potentially. Okay. Okay, Um, I think that's enough for that. I hope you guys understood that example. It's a bit complex. But what you want to remember is that to calculate the life path in Vedic, all you have to do is add up all the numbers. Okay. So just add up one plus three plus one plus nine plus nine plus six, and you'll get the result, which is two. And then put it in the chart right here. Boom. Okay. So for this specific birthday right here, um, the chart would look like this, right? The one would go here, right? We just look at this. This is our template where all the numbers should go. Uh, he has a three, so three would go here. He has a nine. Boom. Oh, sorry. Six is go there. Six right there. Do that. Six right there. And then base number three, the same, right? There's no extra numbers. We leave it as that. Uh, and then is a life path two, right? We have one three, one one, one nine, one six, and one two, and that is their whole birth chart. Now you may say, well, what about the empty spots? Well, those empty spots can tell a story just as much as the filled spots. The empty spots could say, hey, you're missing these qualities. You're not going to be like someone that has a five or a four in their chart. Those are some characteristics you can add to yourself, to your personality, let's say. Um, but again, like I said, the goal potentially of this reality is to detach from all identities, from all personalities. But in some cases, it is definitely use useful to embody certain characteristics to get you through that point of your life, let's say, right? And in some cases, those energies will come in and ask of you to be in a certain way. And sometimes it's better to avoid them and sometimes it's better to use them to your advantage, right? And at least with this numerology, you'll know what to expect. <clears throat> we set the board here. Now we might go a little bit over. I'm not sure how far we've gone in so far, but um, what I failed to mention so far was that the base number so two, let's say 11, um, 1987. The base number is very indicative of a person's 
uh, life, early life, before 30 and before marriage, right? So base equals before thirty or before marriage. Now that means um, their childhood, uh, their life before marriage is going to exhibit qualities of this one plus one, which is two. Uh, um, uh, characteristics okay now again in Pythagorean which I also use in my readings you may even be able to say hey being even just being born on the 11th can exhibit a higher quality of the two a higher intuitive uh, perspective because the two as you'll see is very intuitive so you know we don't reduce the 11th uh, in the Pythagorean perspective, but in Vedic you do. So that's that's your choice whether you choose to use that or not. But they can be elevens can have like a sort of higher quality than the two, from what I've noticed. Right. That, in a sense, is their life before thirty. Why? Because it's kind of the subconscious running the conscious show. Um, so when we're young, when we're kids. Up until the age of seven, we, we just uh, soak everything in, right? We absorb everything. Uh, everything is really governed by our surroundings, by our nearest authority, which is our parents, usually. And we are like sponges, right? And we're, in a sense, immature. We're not fully conscious of our own decisions. Um, and we're acting from this base number energy. And also before marriage, because let's say someone gets married before 30, they are more than likely to then act in a more mature way uh, now that marriage has come because it's demanding a different aspect of themselves. It's asking them to be more on uh, their purpose, more focused, more mature to be able to really conduct themselves in that marriage or not just themselves anymore because now they're taking another person as a part of themselves, right? That's what true love really is, is to extend your self of self, sense of self to fit another person, another being. So they were, are, they're more likely to be more mature after marriage, whereas before marriage, they're still going to be their regular self. So then that being said, when looking at the life path, And we're going to see its effect really coming more into play after 30. Uh, after. Oops. Or after marriage. Right. So after, life path comes into effect after 30 or after marriage, but it's always there. They will still always exhibit those qualities, and the base number will always be there. But their life will will shift more in in the direction of the life path, right? The actual script that was given, that was implanted to that being, then you know merges or shifts, uh, realigns with the life path number, right? What that being really signed up to do, let's say, uh, in terms of its ego or in terms of its story, storyline is better, better word potentially. Um, and again, they become more mature. They're able to better uh, reflect these qualities now that they are now realizing certain things are coming out of their subconscious a bit more and more into the life path to the conscious, seeing things how they really may be. Whereas the base number can be very 
ego based, subconscious based, uh, emotionally based even, and will not always have the full picture, right? And the base number is also reflective of how the person sees themselves, right? Whereas the life path is very much reflective of how they really are and how other people see them. Um, this is analogous to the D1 and the D9 charts in Vedic astrology, or even to the first house and to the seventh house, because that's what the D9 really is. The D9 is the reflection of the seventh house. It, that's what it, it starts taking into account. Well, D9 is ninth house, but it's a reflection of the seventh house, which the D9 also reflects marriage. That's just from the Vedic astrology point of view. So the base number is how a person will see themselves and the life path is how other people will see them. And we'll discuss this more when we get into the actual numbers. Um, so that I can provide specific examples for you and you guys can better understand what I'm talking about. But something to remember um, as we go over this stuff. Um, and then to specifically get into this one last thing before uh, I cut this one short. We see here, number one is the sun. Number two, the moon. Three is Jupiter. Four is Rahu. Five, Mercury. Six, Venus. Seven, K2. Eight, Saturn. Nine, Mars. Uh, so each number has a planet that it represents, has an energy that it, it embodies based on that planet. And they're interrelated, right? Now what Rahu is, for those that don't know, it's the north node of the moon, okay? So four doesn't represent a specific planet, more so a another aspect of the moon. Seven, K2, you guessed it, it's the south node of the moon, right? Four plus seven is 11, one plus one is two, and we get the moon again. For those of you that don't know this the actual story behind, uh, Rahu and Ketu, Rahu is considered the head and Ketu is the body without the head. So what happened was that Rahu and Ketu were, were once one being and they decided they wanted immortality, but it was a very egoic being. And according to the, the Vedic or the Hindu tradition, Hindu myth, uh, I believe it was Krishna that saw that Rahu and Ketu, or Rahu Ketu was about to steal this immortality from the god, from the god. And Krishna, out of, let's say, mercy, threw a spinning disc and chopped Rahu Ketu off at the neck. And it became Rahu, the head without a body, and Ketu, the body without a head. And that is very indicative of how their qualities and characteristics are for each number and for each you know, planet or node, because four is very representative of the ego. It is never satisfied. So it's kind of like a bottomless stomach because it has no stomach, it's just a head. So it just goes right through him and he wants more and more and more. So at least it knows what it wants. It, it can see what it wants and it wants to get it, but it's never satisfied. Whereas K2 is very detached and doesn't want anything because it doesn't even know what it wants since it can't see, it doesn't have a sense of direction. But on the, on, as opposed to Rahu, it can be very detached, very spiritual and uh, naturally satisfied, right? Whereas Rahu is never satisfied, so really doesn't know what it wants. So that's the story of Rahu and Ketu. But just like the days of the week, you know, sun, Sunday is one, moon, Monday, moon day, two, Jupiter's day is Thursday, which will be three, Rahu's day is um, four, but I believe Tuesday is also a representation of it, which we'll see, it's, it's further down in this, in the course. Uh, Mercury, Mercury's day, Mer Mercury, 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 Miércoles in Spanish, um, Wednesday, 
Venus Day, Freya's Day, Friday, um, Saturn, Saturday, Mars, Martes, uh, Tuesday. Okay. So I think that's about it. I hope I didn't miss anything. If not, I'll get to it in the next section. But, but that's about it for part one. Okay. Look forward to seeing you guys, seeing you guys in part two.